We had data come out yesterday. In November and December, we generated $35 million for the businesses just under us. So how do you build revenue from TikTok? With TikTok Shop, essentially it's like, where do you see the opportunities on TikTok with live streaming? Everyone thinks it's gonna be different. I actually think the US version in particular will be... So last week, OpenAI announced Sora. Why is this a game changer? So I think Sora is one step in the whole process of videos becoming... What else do you see is coming up? If there's anything to study from the Chinese market, I think this year... I sat down with Will August, founder and CEO of Outlandish. Officially the number one TikTok shop partner, for TikTok and brands in the US and worldwide. Since his arrival in China 10 years ago, Will has gone from being one of the first foreigner biggest influencers in China to founding and leading several successful ventures. We discuss why Sora is a game changer for everyone, how you can build a TikTok shop from zero to over a million dollars in revenue, and the future of social media in China and the West. Here's my chat with Will August. So last week, OpenAI, announced Sora. Yeah. Why is this a game changer? Okay. Um, so I think Sora is kind of just like one step in the whole process of videos becoming really easy for anyone to make. So if you, if you start back when I started making videos in like 2004, it was really difficult. Even to buy a camera would be expensive. To edit, you'd have to learn Premiere Pro or Final Cut. Then um, this is actually why TikTok is almost also a game changer, game changer because you can use the internal app to film on your phone. So with the the phone becoming kind of the next step in from professional camera to a phone to editing on CapCut on your phone, which is now easier. It, even a lot of people don't do that yet. Um, the next step is you don't even need a phone. You just write a script and it will type it out. So how this is also affecting, um, I would say businesses and creators is Instead of you having to spend $100 or $500 to get a creator to make a video for you to sell your product, for example, you just give the AI like I don't know, a picture of your product and write, I want my product to be basically a TVC, like television commercial level of production for pennies. Um, so it's basically going to change the whole industry. Um, now, if whether that's a good thing or not, it's up for debate, I think, like, is it good that creators are now basically worthless? In the sense that, obviously, if you have a following, um, you're worth a lot. Uh, this, I think this also comes into the debate of um, how TikTok in particular, uh, in China, how they change social media and how they're doing it in the West right now, as we currently speak, it's changing from marketing to sales. So in, in the past, um, businesses would put a lot of value on how many views you got, assuming that it would convert to sales, but not knowing, right? They didn't know. Um, it was very hard to track. In fact, there were tons of businesses that came out that were like basically helping you track it and you'd pay them to, to be able to track it, not accurately. Um, and so what happened in, in TikTok, I would say in like 2020, 2021, is they came out with TikTok shop where uh, and, and now, basically, if you are not able to make a sale um, through TikTok in Chinese social media, people know that. They don't care how many followers you have. They don't care how many views you get. They look at your conversion rate. Um, and so in the West, that's currently happening. It's quite interesting because you see like um, a lot of the creators, uh, the bigger creators, they won't do TikTok shop because they're like, I, I charge $10,000 a video. Why would I do a video for commission only and not know how much I'm gonna sell. Um, so, and the smaller creators who's never seen like a dollar in their life from ads, they're like, oh, this is a great opportunity. So smaller creators are becoming huge, making more money than bigger creators like overnight because the big creators are not jumping on board. So the question is when maybe you don't even need the smaller creators because Sora can create a better video than the bigger creators, the smaller creators. And on a platform like TikTok where um, videos are judged by the quality of the video, not the follower, not the amount of followers. So you could have like 10 followers and make a million views, um, or you could have a million followers and make 10 views. Um, so if you have a high quality video, you don't need a huge amount of following to get more views and get more following. So Sora could change all of this. Um, again, it's already, it's already changed in the last two years. Is it gonna change again with Sora? Up for debate, I don't know, maybe.
Well, we saw that Will Smith video we, about a year ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And how we've advanced to what they released, the yeah. actual trailer. Yeah. But where's the opportunity then? If, if I'm a videographer or I'm a content creator, which I am, and I've got quite a sizable following, it's great for the rising stars. Yeah. So what's the advice? I just have to get on board? or For a creator? Yeah. Um, and for companies. Yeah, I, I would say it's it's less of helping out creators, apart from like adding B-roll. Like in the, in the past, you would go find YouTube video, download them and add it as B-roll. Maybe now you don't need that. You just add it, like use the AI to make high quality B-roll. I think for creators, that's probably the instant usage. For businesses, it's um, supplying their own account with content without having to purchase it from creators at a high price. So creators are going to lose out on that job, essentially. So and especially if they're, if they're not able to guarantee any sales. If they are a creator that can make sales, then they're not going to get replaced, right? Because people value that person's face. They see that person's face and they want to buy like a key opinion of sales, right? Um, but the other ones, they might struggle. Mm. Yeah. So you touched on TikTok as well just now, and you've been very successful in the e-commerce realm. So how do you build revenue on TikTok? Um, so with TikTok shop, essentially it's like, um, basically like Amazon or Timu, except that um, TikTok has over a million creators that want to make money. Um, so you don't have to, it's not, it's not like Amazon where you list a product and if it's a good product, they will sell. Uh, you have to make content. So um, yeah, you work with a ton of creators to make videos and reviews about your product and then hope that one of the videos go viral and people buy it. That's basically what it is. Um, basically, you know, changing the marketing directly to sales without leaving the platform as a closed loop. Yeah. And there's clearly a difference with the live streaming market in China, which is well established. Yeah. Um, some would say slightly oversaturated in the last year or so. Yeah. Where do you see the opportunities on TikTok with live streaming? I, I do think that China is just ahead. I don't think it's going to be much different. Um, I think everyone, everyone thinks it's going to be different. I actually think, my opinion is, I think the US version in particular will be better than the Chinese version. Because of my opinion, I think Americans are very creative and they, when they do things like production, they do it very well, much better than the Chinese. Like if you look at any Chinese film in the last 10 years, name one that you think was amazing. Like and there's not that many. Well, I've just watched one at the weekend, actually, the, uh, the boxing one. Did you see that one? Uh, yeah. No. Is it good? Yeah, yeah, it's worth, it's worth a watch. Oh, okay. And they've incorporated the Rocky theme. But compared to like Hollywood and compared to even like YouTube or compared to, um, I would say, I would even argue TikTok creators are better than Dolian creators. Mm -hmm. So when it even comes to selling, I think the Americans are going to take over um, the quality of selling, the way that they sell more than the Chinese. And there's also, um, it's a bit of a cultural difference as well. Uh, same, same in the UK. In America, and the UK, people don't like to be sold to as much as the Chinese. Um, you can even see this like in offline stores. In offline stores, people expect a higher level of service when you walk in like, oh, hi, hi sir, what would you like? Does this interest you? In the UK, people don't like that. Generally speaking, if you walk in shopping, people start bugging you, you leave, right? <laughs> yeah, so, I, had, I had that in December. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's the same yeah. online. If you walk into a live stream instantly like, oh, I want to sell you this, this is the deal. Um, it doesn't translate. It's actually, I would say the biggest problem with Chinese agencies that do it very well in China, when they try and do it in the US, they use the same model, it doesn't work. You have to be much more creative. You have to make it more entertaining, more fun. Um, and then the sales come naturally. So the same as offline. Um, so I, I think it will be done better in the West, but it's going to be like another two or three years. And would you also say it's going to be more sustainable? Um, I think the same. Um, I think, so in in China and the difference between China and the West mainly isn't isn't online shopping is like less or more. I'd say it's similar, I'm not sure. Um, but in China, live stream shopping is a lot more popular. Um, I think, I believe it's over 50 or 60% of sales on the Chinese version of TikTok is through live stream. Whereas in Western countries, it's between 10 and 20%. In Southeast Asia, it's already over 50%. So obviously, Asian cultures accept live stream shopping a lot more easier 
than Western cultures. But I do think it's just a question of time. Uh, it's not an if, it's a when. Um, people, yeah, it, it, and it's a different culture. I, and I think the reason for that um, is, I think it's a difference between a developed and a developing country. Um, in a developing country, you actually want this stuff, right? A lot of the stuff they're selling in the live stream for a really good price, you want. But in the UK, for example, if they were selling, like, perfect example, um, toilet paper, right? In, in Southeast Asia, if you have a good price on toilet paper in a live stream, it will keep people there and they will buy the hell out of it. Mm. In the UK, that would never happen. People, that, people do not lack that product, right? There's a difference between demand. Um, and with, cert, with different demands come like, much, it's much easier to sell certain things, especially cheaper things. Whereas in the West, the demand of the products is more on the higher end products rather than the lower end products. That's already been sold. But the higher end products will not come in the West um, for a while, mainly because the brands aren't ready and they don't understand it. So there's an educational part to it as well. So once they reach that level, then people will start taking the live stream more seriously. But it's not—it's it's almost like the opposite in in developing countries, you know. Because that to get to sell toilet paper is a lot easier than to sell LV bags, you know. But yeah, so that I think that's the difference. Mm. You've got quite strong opinions on Tmall, and Tmall has become a phenomenon in mm -hmm. the West. I mean, in December I was in the UK. <clears throat> My whole family were using it. Yeah, um, it's pinned door door here in China. Yeah. So, what's your opinion on it? Um, I I think it's a bad. I think it's a good idea in the short term. Like for people that want to buy things they can't afford, and pinned door door is taking. I, I heard they're taking a thirty dollar loss on each order on average, right? For to get their their shock, uh, shock their stock prices up. Um, but. My opinion is, right, if you are buying, if you're constantly buying stuff directly from the factory, what are you doing? You're cutting out the middleman's job. And a lot of the people that are using Timu are the middleman. So when they, when they lose their job, they should not be surprised because they are essentially cutting out their own job, right? If you, if you look at like um, department stores all closing down, why? Because they're buying online. Why do you need a department store? I can buy on Timu for half the price, cut your job out. But I think... Overall, that's really bad for the economy. It's, it's basically a downward spiral, I think. That's my opinion on it. Um, and also, they are taking advantage of um, shipping policies. They're dodging taxes, like coming into the country. I, I don't know how they're doing it, like at this ridiculous price and direct to your door. But I, I feel like someone should step in to stop it before it get, goes too far. That's my opinion. Um, but I understand why people use it. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah. Well, I think in China, Pindodor works because it's all about price sensitivity, right? They want something that's going to undercut Taobao. So yeah. they'll go for Pindodor. Yeah. And that it's, idea of like group buying. It's terrible though. I think if you're just you're just going for the lowest price possible and uh, factories hate it because Timu, the only price, the only way Timu is getting a lower price is because they are um, adding an extreme amount of pressure to these factories where they are not even making a profit. So the factory is not making a profit the, there's no middleman and it's only pinned or door their stock price is going up. That's, that's the only pe person making any um, profit out of this. Also, the, the, maybe the customer in the short term, they get some cheap products. But mm, yeah, that's, I, don't think, I don't think it's a good idea, personally. So from your China experience, do you think there's an opportunity there for a new social media or a new e-commerce platform to come in yeah. and do something that's legitimate. I mean, that's what I think, I hope that's what TikTok shop is doing. So um, TikTok shop does make huge uh, strides to support local businesses, much more than um, D2C businesses. They, they are notorious for blocking a lot of these businesses when they um, price spam, as they say. So you're, the local business selling $30, they're selling $2. And it's like, how are they doing that? Well, they're not doing it for a profit. They're doing it at a loss so that they gain control of the market. But the only people that can do that is the factory themselves. And yeah, it's good for the factory once they knock out you know, the competition, but these local businesses are all shut down. So um, TikTok is doing a good job at trying for that, at trying for that not to happen. Yeah, but again, 
it is hard to stop. You know how the Chinese factory, they can get past any regulation eventually, <laughs> even on Amazon. Amazon's also struggled with them. Mm. Yeah. But even on Amazon, you can get the cheap stuff, but they don't really like advertise it as like, go for the cheap stuff. They're like, go for the, the quality stuff. And, and I think customer service does matter and branding does matter. Um, otherwise, everyone's just like, just bombarded with crap, essentially. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so I'm getting a lot of inquiries. I know you are with Chinese companies going outbound. So wanting mm -hmm. to set up TikTok shops or... Yeah. Um, so where are the opportunities there? Um, I mean, there's tons of opportunity, especially on, on TikTok right now, where there's a lot of incentives. Um, the commission taken from the platform is very low. I think it's like 5% right now compared to Amazon, which is 15 to 20% from the platform. So you're getting that incentive. There's shipping subsidies. Um, if you have a local warehouse, TikTok is paying for the shipping to the customer. Um, so I think that, yeah, there's a lot of opportunities um, basically for any business. Uh, to upload their products and to try it out. There's there's also a lot of barriers as well. Obviously, you need a social security number in the US, you need a local business. Um, so you, you need all your products to be in fulfillment centers locally in the US. So like I said, they are, they're, they're, they're not against having Chinese business, but you have to be local. You have to support the local economy. Um, so yeah, I mean, any any products open game right now. There's, there's biz, like we run, uh, we, we had data, come out yesterday, in November and December, we generated uh, $35 million for the businesses just under us, just in, in under our um, TSP, Ticket Shop Partners. So that's a crazy amount, especially since the, the market just opened in uh, officially in July. So, yeah. And what kind of products are these? Everything. Um, tech, fashion, um, supplements, Beauty, any any viral products, you know. What specifically? What's a um, real winner? There's no there's no specific. I would say the winning products are either a product that people already buy at a slight discount, which you would get because of the uh, the subsidies from the platform, or it's a product that's very easily demonstratable in a video because TikTok compared to other platforms that it's a content platform, so the majority of your sales will be through content, whether that's live streams or videos, not just people searching. It's not like a, I, I would say it's not a demand platform. It's an interest platform. So if your product's able to demonstrate properly, and, and this is uh, an opportunity for products that aren't well known to the market yet. So if it's like a product that's new, but it's very useful and you can demonstrate it well, and what pain point is this solving in this customer's or this user's life, you can demonstrate that, then it will sell through videos. And, and that's, that's, what, that's our service, right? We, we help them, people uh, reach out to like a thousand creators, get a thousand people to make a video on it. And then if it doesn't sell for a thousand videos, it's just not going to sell. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. where do you see the next few months as far as products um, in particular? If, if we're going to dig a little bit more, you know, yeah. to what would be one product, let's say, that, that works in China that would also work um, in the West as well? Fashion. Fashion will be the biggest seller this year by far. Main reason for that is um, there's going to be a push on live stream content and fashion sells the best through live stream content based on all market data. Um, so yeah, fashion live streams will be number one this year. So fast fashion or? or... No, not necessarily fast fashion, especially in, in the West. The price of fashion, I would say, is not as sensitive as other countries. It's more about whether it's a good design uh, whether it's high quality, even like eco-friendly. Um, yeah, it's not because the average price point, I would say for fashion in the US is like 30 to $50. Even in the UK, it's like 10 to 20 pounds. So it's a big difference even between the UK and the US market. Um, obviously cheap stuff does sell, but no one's making money. So let's try not to do that. I, I, I'm really not a fan of fast fashion. Um, but yeah, it, same in China, I would say. Um, you have people with money that are willing to spend. You have people with no money that are looking to get a good deal as well. So you have both markets. Yeah. And what's the difference in live streaming, let's say on Douyin compared to TikTok? Because Douyin is very much like yeah. In the West, would you say it's a little bit more of a kind of QVC style? No. Um, I mean, for fashion, I would say it's like different because fashion's a very demonstratable item where it's like catwalk or this is the clothes and put it, look how good it looks. So that is very similar to China, I would say. Um, but other ones, it's it's less about 
like how cheap this is and it's more about why you would purchase it and is it a good deal not cheap but a good deal i think that that's the diff that's a big uh, differentiator you need to say it's like if it's cheap then people are looking for like five dollars if it's a good deal it's like you buy three for forty dollars or, or rather than one for 20. so it's not lower price it's just a deal um so people are looking for that but yeah it, it's very it, i would say it's very different um and the other, the other thing I would say is the China market is much more mature. So people are already going there to shop. Whereas TikTok, the vast, vast, vast majority are not going to TikTok to shop. So you can't go straight in with the sale. You have to go in slowly, be more entertaining. In fact, I would say be um, even slightly less professional than the China market. Because, you know, their live streams are like really like high quality HD. But if you do that... Um, you're gonna, when people are scrolling, it's, it's like a sore, you're gonna have a sore eye because this is completely different from every other piece of content on the platform in, an, in a QVC way. And people don't actually want to watch QVC. If they want to watch QVC, they would go to QVC, but they're on TikTok. They're looking for like some fun content, entertaining content. But so you make, you have to mix entertainment with shopping at this point. Yeah. One mistake I've seen with a lot of Chinese companies that have TikTok shops is they use their own people. And actually, the level of English is not that great. Yeah. So they're trying to connect with a Western audience that is not too hot on China right now. Yeah. And if they localize, which is what we always tell Western companies yeah. to do in China, yeah. they would have a lot more success. So it's so important. Like, if, if you can't speak English properly, fluently, I, I, wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't say that they have to be a native English speaker. I would say they have to be fluent in English. And that's not like, that's not even saying grammatically fluent. It's like, you know, you know what, fluent, like Jack Ma, right? Mm. I would say he's relatively fluent. Mm. He's, not great, he's not great at grammar, mm. but he's interesting to listen to. You need that in your presenter, whether they're Chinese or not. I don't think it matters. I think that's also a, a little bit of um, a misunderstanding. Everyone's like, oh, they can't look Chinese. No, that doesn't, the, looking Chinese doesn't matter. It's speaking fluently is what matters. Yeah. And being like culturally, like saying culturally mm. relevant things and not just being like broken English, this is cheap. You know, mm. that's terrible. Well, culturally aware, I think if you were selling to a British audience, maybe you'd have to use some bits of slang, bits of... Yeah. Use words like sick. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Otherwise, they're just going to be like, mm, this isn't a guy I would watch. Yeah. yeah. So you're considered one of the first foreign influencers in China, right? So yeah. Ten, 10 years ago? I started in 2015. Right. Oh, nine, nine, nine years, years ago. Almost wow. 10 years. I remember seeing your content back then and thinking, oh, I want to strive towards that really <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, so where are the opportunities for western companies to still expand in the in the influencer world when it comes to the different chinese yeah. platforms I, I mean i would say i mean china's like are they the biggest market in the world or second biggest i can't are they first now i mean they've they become i think the u.s is still first right for e-commerce for uh just the consumers per oh, say china china oh, say china yeah. Yeah, so obviously there's a market, right? Mm. Um, the, the problem with the China market is just so different to every other market, like shopping channels, the way social media works. Um, but yeah, there's a huge opportunity for basically any business, but it's very different. So um, you need a team that understands the market. Otherwise you will fail and lose a lot of money. <laughs> and would you say quite a balanced team? Because I know a lot of Western companies that, go purely Chinese. And mm -hmm. I think, particularly if you're a British or American company, you need to have that cultural awareness on both sides yeah. and also language. Yeah. Um, I, I think you can't go fully Chinese because they're not going to understand your brand enough. Because you still need to, you need to translate it locally, but keep the branding the same, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's good to have a mix. I, I would say you want... If I, if I was going to launch a brand in China, I would say like one or two Westerners or wherever my business is from and the rest Chinese. Mm. I don't think it needs to be like majority foreigners. Mm. I think it needs to be majority Chinese. Mm. So when I first started, like, I actually started on a platform called Yoku, which basically doesn't exist now. And then I went to, I think I was on IT for a while, which is now like the Netflix, mm. which, which was, is kind of weird 
being a social media and just uploading to Netflix, right? But you could back them. Um, and then I went to Billy Billy where I saw a lot of traction. So I, I think in the first two months, I got to like 100,000 followers. So what is Billy Billy? Um, Billy Billy is a copy website of a Japanese anime website originally. Um, so actually the main user base are like re people really into anime. They used to be. Um, and then they slowly transitioned more into YouTube. Um, so their, their content, I think it was around 2015 when I joined, um, they were opening up to more content creators and trying to copy YouTube. Um, and yeah, and then I, I would say in the last um, eight years, they've moved away from the anime side a lot. Uh, I would say maybe like 30% is anime and now it's long form video content. Um, they're trying to move into short form, but not as successfully as competitors. Like TikTok, quite sure came out in what, 2019? Which is like four years after I started with Billy Billy and they just did not adapt fast enough to short form content. Um, and basically a large portion of their audience has moved onto their competitor platform. So I don't know how well they're doing, but they're not doing great as far as I know. Yeah. I will see Billy Billy as that young generation that will be the future buyers in five, 10 years, right? I, I would say yes, but I think a lot of that audience has been sucked onto Kuaishou and Douyin. Yeah. I would say back, if you asked me like 2018, I would say Billy Billy all the way. Mm. Now I'm like, I don't know who's still there, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I am. <laughs> Listen, they, they wanted to expand like their audience. So they, they were like a young audience, but what they did is um, they went on the, they went, uh, on the New York Stock Exchange mm. and they're like, we need to grow our audience like fast, right? So I, I don't know when it, was it like 2020? I can't remember. Um, but in doing that, they lost a lot of their core audience and now they just have like a bit of everything, um, which I don't know, I don't know if that's good um, but because they, they lost a bit of their soul in the way mm. as, it, as they expanded and, and everyone saw it, right? Um, and I think one of the biggest problems with Billy Billy is when, you know, when they first started, you know, what their promise was to their users, they said they would never put an ad in a video. That's what they said. And I think that was a huge mistake because mm. how are they going to monetize? So the, the way they monetize, um, which I, I hated is, and I think they've changed this since then. Um, when I, back in the day, when I made a video and I, I took an ad, they would um, take a cut from me, like person, from the creator. So that's, imagine you're doing an ad on YouTube and you know, it's, um, well, who does ads on YouTube now? Like, uh, and it's some, some language education one. And you take like a thousand, a thousand pounds. They'll be like, I want 600. Otherwise, otherwise you'll get no views. That's what they used to do. Well, that's what Little Red does now. Really? Yeah, so Little Red. They've changed that model now that. in the last couple of years. Yeah. So now, if I sign a deal with a company and they pay me, say, a thousand pounds, you have to declare it on Little Red and they'll take a cut. I hate that so much. It's like, why can't you make your own money? Why, why are you taking the money from the creator? It's like they're the MCM. Um, but that's because Chinese people do just hate ads. And I think that's because brands. Uh, I think that I actually hate Google and YouTube as much as you like, they've done an amazing job mm. with monetizing their creators. And that's, I, I also think that's the biggest downfall of Billy Billy is that they never paid their creators properly. So even now, they, I think last year there was like a strike or whatever from creators. Did you hear about that? A strike in China. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, they said they were all stopping uploading to Billy Billy because oh. they, they lowered the um, amount of uh, pay they would get per view. Mm. So the quality of the content could never improve because it did not matter how many views you got, you still were paid the same, which, and then it just matters how many brand deals you get and the platform takes a cut. So if you have an audience, you just take brand deals all the time. It doesn't matter how crappy your video is, just the, so the quality of the content goes down. And that's like, I would say the whole of the China market was in this kind of downward spiral. And that's where, that's where TikTok came along. Like I'm taking some of this. Downward spiral with content from higher to lower and shorter videos um, now to Kuaishou and Douyin. So that's kind of what happened because they didn't pay creators properly. And explain what Kuaishou is because I've just been to Guangxi, like where the 
border is with Vietnam. Oh, yeah. And everyone was using Quai Shaw down there. Yeah. No one's using Dol Yin. It's, it's like a, it's a competitor to uh, Dol Yin, but they're aimed at, I would say, more countryside people. So the content differs slightly. Um, maybe I would say like a little bit more patriotic crowd, um, more into like farmer content, if that makes sense. Uh, the jokes I don't really get personally, uh, like, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything bad. Know, ladies <laughs> dancing around with a leak and that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's what I say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But like, um, I, I do think it's good to have a competitor to TikTok like on, on the same level as, as TikTok, doing basically the same thing. Um, and that I think in the West, that platform doesn't really exist. I think in Instagram and YouTube are trying to compete, but again, um, Instagram is more aimed at your friends and people you follow. YouTube is more aimed at long form content and people you follow. TikTok is aimed at every, every swipe is a different video and you probably don't even remember who you followed. Um, you might follow like a thousand people. So there's no real similar platform, but in China, quite sure is that platform. Um, and they have tried to expand outside of China, not not so successfully. Um, they're just not good as, they're not as global as ByteDance. But that's, I mean, everyone says like, ByteDance is I think the first example of a social media platform from China going global. Um, so everyone's, yeah, it, it's impressive what they've done. And ByteDance, I, I don't know about, the, if you know about their other platforms, like Jinru Tao Tiao. That's where yeah, they Tiao. Yeah. yeah. Um, they got, they've coming out with a uh, Duan Ju uh, platform soon. Like the, you know, like the 10, what was it? Like the, the series, like Tabian, mm. where it's kind of like, um, what's it called? Uh, like werewolf meets their lover or something mm. like that. Have you seen them? No, I haven't seen In them. In China, it's like really popular right now. And it's really profitable. So, um, and then, and I know, I know, I know a few friends doing this. Um, what do you mean werewolf meets what? Kind of Twilight stuff? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, like right, Twilight, okay. Kind right. of like Twilight stuff, but like um, two minute uh, short films. Right. right. It's, like a, it's like a TV series. So they post it on TikTok. And even on TikTok, it's profitable. Mm. Like Americans are buying into it as well. But it started in China. Um, and they take these really popular like scripts, make it into a series of like 20 series. Mm. You watch the first three. If you want to continue watching, it's going to cost. And then, and then you have to download the app and you pay like, uh, I think it's like $2 a, an episode. And if you $2 for up to the end of the series, people are buying it. Um, so ByteDance came out with their own app, I think doing this um, soon. They have a ton of apps. Um, and one of my favorite apps is their Lark. Like facial, have you used facial? No, I haven't. It's like, um, it's like Excel mixed with Google Drive, mixed with Slack, mixed with Calendly, mixed with Zoom. It's amazing. It's like all in one, everything you need to do for your business. And it's cheaper. It's like very reasonably priced and no one knows about it outside of uh, China, but they have like tens of thousands of programmers working on this thing. It's, um, it's, it's the best thing I've ever used. Like for business management, it's amazing. So it's a little hidden gem that yeah. nobody knows about. Yeah, yeah. They have their own like programming language inside of it. It's and because it's an it, it started from their internal use, and then they made it like a a subscription for businesses. But yeah, very very powerful. Mm. Yeah, but ByteDance is a very impressive mm. company. So Will, you just touched on a great app to keep an eye on for twenty twenty four. What else do you see is coming up? Apps, apps. Like in general. Social media, I mean, you mentioned earlier about there's an opportunity for another social media to come in there that encompasses. Yeah, I think so. E-commerce um, and content. I, I think if anything to study from the, if there's anything to study from the Chinese market, uh, which I think there is, I think this year, if TikTok is successful in launching live streams, it's it's going to have the same effect as in China. Live stream will be a major source of income for e-commerce. Um, if TikTok is successful, Amazon will need to follow. YouTube will need to follow. Instagram will need to follow. I mean, they've tried it previously, not successfully, but that's because they are not, they weren't aggressive enough. And a lot of people think that it happened organically in China. I don't think it was organic. I think it, it was created by force. <laughs> so if, if that happens, if that happened in China it, and they succeed in the West, it, it will be uh, quite a big game changer. 
in terms of how people purchase online. Mm. Apart from that, um, AI live streaming. Um, yeah, they have that in China. AI live streaming, I think, only works if people are buying from the live stream anyway. Um, so if it becomes a consumer habit and people are coming back and you don't want to be live at 1 a.m. in the morning, put an AI person on there. Mm. But the AI live streaming is very good already. You can barely tell it's not a real person. So yeah, I, probably. Yeah. If people want to get in touch with you, Will, where can they find you? Go to the website, uh, outlandishdigital.us or creatorsamples.com. Um, and then find the contact information, probably mm. the best way. Yeah. And you're mainly based in the States, right? Yeah. Because kind of switch between China and the States. Yeah, yeah, yeah mainly in the States. Yeah. yeah, cool. Thank you so much. For thank learning. you. Learned so much, really appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, we'll have you on the pod again. All right, thank you. Yeah, cool. Until next time, guys, subscribe, like, see you next time.